your fabulousness in my life, my darling. And look, colleagues, let's start the last party. And I'll obviously start with an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, elders past and present, and any Indigenous colleagues with us today. And this has been a joyous time of my life. When I think back on COVID, as I'm sure we all will, some truly terrible things have happened, but some truly remarkable and miraculous and seriously odd things have happened. And this reading seminar is one of them. And while I have known some of you for a very, very long time, I've met brand new, astonishing people who have changed my life. And what a privilege and what a joy that is. And that's something I won't take for granted. So I'm so thankful for you and so thankful for your expertise. So should we do the last one? Should we do this? Should we do it? Should we bring it home? Thanks for that. I get silent nods. Well, welcome to Zoom. Great. Um, colleagues, now this is this is the book published in 2019. So we've we've brought the story to when the next book is about to appear, which I think is in a matter of months, weeks, perhaps. So that's tremendous. But we're at 2019, Duke University Press once more, which is significant. What's the use on the uses of use? Interesting, quirky fascinating book uh, and it's a great place for us to end and it's a great time for us to end and I wanted to open up if I can with it because obviously we all know each other very well now we've been on a lot of journeys together as a family and therefore I wanted to start hard this week rather than soft sort of let's all have a bit of a, a softball moment and let's relax let's actually start hard and I wanted to start with the hard start of this book which Ahmed described as quote the normalization of sexual harassment in universities, end of quote. Now, you know, very uncomfortable place to start, but we need to start in that discomfort, I think, this time. The normalization of sexual harassment in universities. So before we get into that bigger issue, could I start with the how, colleagues? How is sexual harassment normalized? How do we normalize this process? Leanne, I'll start with you because you and I will always start crunchy to give everyone else a little bit of time. Leanne, how is this bad stuff normalized? Noting that Australian universities are a bit of a hot spot for this at the moment. Oh, how is it normalized? Um, well, it comes from outside the university. It doesn't start within it. It comes from a wider framework that commodifies women's bodies in a particular way and primarily it's a sexual commodification in, in you know and combine that with a conservative masculinity that doesn't know how to interface those meanings with complexity yeah. I think and also you know women do it to themselves as well in many ways um what, by not looking after other women, looking away, normalising it? Uh, yeah, and also sometimes adopting the very meanings that are coercive and problematic in many ways. Yeah. And that's a really controversial and difficult thing to say first thing, I would suggest. Well, that's, that's internalising the oppression. So we're back to that situation, which is a real thing. That's a real thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so how it becomes normalised is part of practice, it's part of common sense, it's part of the everyday. Yeah. Um, it, it becomes the default and in order to move out of it, you have to work harder. And so that gets people uncomfortable um, because we, if we draw an arm, it's kind of internal dialogue with happiness in particular, this idea of you're coming from this, an internal perspective, perhaps of anxiety of how you're interfacing and relating with another person and you're not quite sure about that or you've developed tools that cover your own insecurities and your own drive for these kind of unstable mm. happiness movements. And so we then default into strategies that we think the other person is resonating with and it's actually not cool. It's actually uh, it's a shorthand of trying to relate to each other, which is 
underneath it, primarily dangerous and disturbing. And Leanne, you've helped us a lot there. We're going to return to that because what you've already opened up is what occurs later in the book about the importance of querying or defamiliarizing our movements through landscapes, which is a very powerful part of that book. That that's brilliant. Aiden, you know I was going to go straight to you. You know what I'm going to do? Hi, Aiden. Hello. Should we talk about blokes leadership in universities, Aiden? Should we? Should we ever? <laughs> Let's go straight there, Aidan. Let's talk about what happens, the normalisation of sexual harassment, when uh, we've got blokes, and I just have to call this way, heteronormative, procreative blokes frequently trained in the hard experimental sciences as the trope of leadership. Take it away, brother. Well, I think, I think to, add to, the, um, to add to that as well, it's also a little bit colonial. I think particularly of our own university, but the others in South Australia and, and probably around the country I haven't really done much scholarship on, on the um, profiles of these people. But there is that, like there is definitely a conservative impulse. I really liked that word, Leanne, like conservative I think is really, that's really powerful um, because there's this um, adoption of it, it. And look, Tara, I think you've captured it already, right? It's the hard science trained. It's the, um, sort of the old school boys club. It's the um, reproduction of what they think is good for everybody, but is actually really only good for a very, very small number of, if anybody, frankly. Um, it's a, yeah, it's like this weird, corrupt, political common sense that um, infects, I think, basically the entire senior leadership. <laughs> of an institution um and the i think it you know it goes along with all of those those the problems yeah. that emerge out of that go along with this idea that we're this untouchable impenetrable genius um group that gets to make all of these decisions in an, in a in a bubble which is not true because it filters down um and damages everything below it basically it reinforces the the negative I don't yet. Can, can I push you? I'm going to push Please you. Do. Are we back to the Sykes and Matt uh, technique of neutralization? So they are trained in the same way at the same elite institutions with the same knowledge systems, tropes, disciplinary paradigms. And they the the cream rises to the top. Other things rise to the top too, but we won't use those metaphors. Cream <clears throat> supposedly rises to the top. Uh, and therefore a technique of neutralization is in place where uh, sexualized behavior. Uh, is naturalized, normalized, that's just the way things are? Is that a possibility? Yeah, well, there's certainly an uncritical nature amongst that sort of, I mean, I mean, it's the same for CEOs, I think, in a sense, you know, it's like that entire, that block of like, um, you know, ruling, ruling class, um, you know, CEOs, business people, politicians you know it's that whole that ideology it sort of maintains itself it's got its own um it's got its own bubble and it's got its own method of reproduction and and absolutely tara it's that um it yeah it, it is it's just like it's comfortable it doesn't look at itself it doesn't see itself as a problem it thinks that everybody else is the problem and if they could just get their shit like just stop complaining we'd be all right you know that's <laughs> where it tends to go. <laughs> right, I am I am so moved. That was a great way to start. I am so excited. I think that's absolutely accurate. Between you and Leanne, my head has just exploded. Um, so who knew we'd start with sexual harassment? But again, we have to intervene. What's the use of use? We have to intervene in the use of a woman's body and our trans community, because remember the violence against the trans community, the violence against those bodies in our universities, in publishing, in the streets, you know, this is something to be exploring, the use of use. Yeah. Wow. Karima, can you and I have a bit of a moment? Good evening. Hello. And look, I wanted you and I to do our definitional work because you've been my definitional queen through the whole gig, really. And, you know, I love the title of this book. I love great titles. And this is a great title. You know, what's the use? Right. What's the actual point of this? What's the use? So how did you gain a, a configuration of use? and usefulness or uselessness from this book. And I'll use that great quote. The question of use becomes a personal question, a question about how a person lives a life. 
How are you dealing with use in your life? After reading the book, mm. I love the book, by the way. Yeah. I, found it was, I actually really, um, I really like her following use around historically. I learned a lot um, about the whole utilitarian and the whole schooling, you know, the whole discussion on, um, you know, just sort of the creation of and colonial schools and, and, but I don't know. I never know how to answer your questions because she talks about use so many ways. There's so many ways. Use as repetition, right? She talks about use as repetition. And then there was another one that like kind of contrasted with that. What was it? Use or use as not using something, you know, and that you have to use something in order to make it more usable. You know, the path came up so often and she kind of loves to, to point to the paradox. You know, it's a lot of paradoxes with hers. I find, you know, a lot of sentences where it's the same sentence with a comma and then this, you know, and then the same, you know, she likes to invert things to show the, so I don't know really, I don't know. I just know I really enjoyed it. And I did have a <laughs> moment actually, because I bought uh, two new desks from Ikea to put in my basement so my kids can video game with their dad because they all love this Roblox game. And I was using, before that, de those desks, I was using a utility table. So I reclaimed my utility table. I was using it for desks. But it's a utility table, a folding table, you know, those yeah. rectangles, you see them in, in school, you know, those kind of things. So I had this moment where I was like, what is going on here? You know, there's a utility table that I was using as a desk, and now I'm reclaiming it so that I can put it in my storage room so that I can use it for the rightful purpose, which is to take it out on occasion for a party. Or Anyway, so when you say about the use, that came to mind, just how I was looking at that table and thinking. Oh, and look, the idea of utility table, because I mean, that's the, probably the best metaphor of all in the universe. It's all the ants thing. She was just going, I need to go to Ikea. Or I need to get me a utility table. But can I say the irony of that expression is that that table doesn't have a singular purpose. It's not prescribed with how you're meant to use it. So it exists if you need a table that's not a table. Uh, and so you need something that's flexible. Then you have a utility table. Yeah, she should be on, she should be writing about tables, utility tables. How did that not come up? I wonder. Yeah. Oh, look. And then again, <laughs> part of part of what Alyssa, uh, Aid, and I are doing at the moment with our work on disability and impairment, of course, use and misuse of environments in creating an ableist universal design environment is quite important here as well. You rock, Karima, and the hair's ma magnificent, but you know that. Thomas, should we do should we do our moment? Let's you and I have our moment. I can't Let's believe I won't be having a weekly moment with you. Are you ready? Uh, I'm not ready to not have a weekly moment with you, if that's the question. I am so excited I could explode. The internet will go bonkers upon your conversation, sir. Look, let's do this. Uh, and look, I felt this very deeply this week. It's been quite a challenging week uh, in Australia. It's been quite a challenging week um, in South Australia, in, in this university indeed. And I was quite fascinated by... Uh, the removal from conversations, Thomas, and I did want to talk about this with you. There was a statement, when you question the point of something, the point seems to be how quickly you can be removed from the conversation. End of quote. So I love that. So anybody who is, and I'll use the word critical, although it's a complicated word these days, if anybody makes the question, asks a question, says, is that right? You sure? Shouldn't we be doing it this way? The priority then becomes not changing it or reflecting upon it. The focus becomes removing that questioner from the conversation. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, higher education it... based on that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I The two things that really stuck out with me at this book, and I think out of all of Ahmed's readings, I think this one, the happiness one, and the will one, like her little trilogy, is by far my favorite. But kind of going back to the metaphor of the path and thinking about it in terms of higher education, like if you are going off the path or if you're refusing to walk down the path or if you're questioning whether or not the path is the appropriate route, then you are no longer welcome on the path and that path is no longer for you. 
And it kind of struck me while y'all were talking about sexual harassment in the university, her comment about form following function. And so, you know, there is an ideological element to it, but also the structure of the university also enables that sexual harassment to occur because it's modeled after prisons, it's modeled after hospitals, and we all know what kind of sexual harassment goes on in those buildings. And so it seems like there's this very, uh, the path is very well beaten and institutionalized to the point where like, unless you meet that like very uh, white, straight, single, non-socially tied student that can just, you know, zip down the path really quickly, then you're kind of left either not allowed on the path or you have to walk next to it or you're hindered from entering whatsoever. Um, And it makes me feel like the utility of the university in of itself, just based on the design, makes me question what it even is for, particularly today. And there there it is. And if I'm ruthless, Thomas, obviously you and Aidan uh, are just you know, getting me into that zone and the three of us are having quite an interesting conversation here. But would you argue, therefore, that the casualised nature of university contracts, the precariat, the zero hour contracts and so forth, all of that is about creating flexibility to in many ways silencing the questioner as required? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's like what we talked about, yes, not yesterday, last week. Um, all the days are running together about, you know, uh, sexism in the workplace when you are casual staff. Like you can't say anything because if you say something, there's 300 people behind you ready to take your job. Um, And it also kind of gets tied up too in like, what is the use of teachers as well? Because you have this like super disciplinary structure and architecture, but we're in like the capitalist realism phase where like the teacher's utility is now like, the entertainer facilitator, but also the disciplinary authoritarian. And so you have to like get them to pass the test, but you have to like entertain them and feed them candy throughout the entire process. So it's like, what are the teachers doing? What is the building doing? Like there's just, it, it seems like a circus right now. And, and there's the title of your next book that you will probably write with Aidan Thomas. Unbelievable. Now, of course, you've provided, as always, a magnificent link to Fatima. Fatima, my darling, let, let's talk about you and your amazing point that you've been having that great conversation with Romy about silence. So, Fatima, would you like to talk to us about how silence operates in, in cutting people's use value, if I can use that phrase, use value out of institutions like universities? Um. Well, it's really interesting because I think of silence almost as a deafening. It's it's not silence as in something that you can't hear, but it's so loud that we choose to ignore it. Wow. <laughs> but okay, well, then we then ask the next question: How how is it ignored, Fatima? Because it's convenient to ignore it. So in other words, people keep walking into rooms filled with white blokes and they go, that's, that's normal, you know, without even asking the question. Is, is, that, is that so? It's, and so the silence, the people who are not even on the campus to be going in the escalator up to that office to be in that meeting, we're not e- we can't even get to the point of asking that question because the silence is so big. Absolutely. I mean, the cynic in me would say that it's probably cheaper in the kind of the capitalist neoliberal approach, it's cheaper to keep people quiet. Just let things go as they're going because it fills somebody's pockets, maybe not necessarily ours, but it's filling someone's pockets. I'll, I'll go straight to one for Romy, who's who's just living the dream in the chat, <laughs> chat box. I'm gonna bring Romy straight in. So let's talk about cheaper for whom or who, Romy, talk to me. Well, I first of all want to say that I heard Sarah, to answer your question, I heard Sarah Ahmed talk and give a lecture yesterday on complaint, and it was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And just to say that, because I feel like maybe I haven't uttered this, or I don't know if I feel, I've really enjoyed this group. And we kind of go into sort of critiquing her work quite a lot. But some of the thing that I want to pull back is that I want to just say how important she is, both as... Um, a thinker, 
um, as a presence within and outside of the academy. Absolutely. And I think that's so important because there's, I, I think the, fo the tendency is to focus on breaking apart what she's not doing and maybe she could be doing, but actually I sometimes think what's so, what's the use of this scholar? And yesterday I saw in action mm -hmm. what the power and the purpose of this extraordinary human yes. as a thinker yes. um, is how she emboldened people, how people felt liberated by what she had to say, as though people, to quote her inspiration, which is Audrey Lord, how she was able to give name to the nameless so that it can be thought, you know, because that's Lord's articulation about poetry. Poetry's function is about giving name to the nameless so it, it can be thought. That is Sarah Ahmed's use. Yes. both inside and outside of the academy, her use and purpose to those of us who have been silenced, who have been dismissed, who have been dismantled, is to give us a language where we are in dialogue with her as equals. It's not about a paternalism. It's about a language which is about enabling and facilitating and supporting and um, essentially something that makes you feel that you're not going crazy. Yes. So you are, there is a there is a witness to your experience, and there were so many things that this extraordinary scholar was saying that chimed with so many people within that space. Um, I want to quote from a poem, and I immediately thought of it when I thought about what is Sarah Ahmed's use, and I went to another poem, which is were two but I'll tell you about the second one, mm. which is I went to Julia Kasdorf's poem, What I Learned from My Mother. Uh, now, I'm not positing her as a mother figure at all within the academy. I don't think that that's how I read her. But I want to go to this line from Kasdorf's What I Learned From My Mother. She says, uh, I had learned to believe I had the power to ease awful pains materially like an angel. Like a doctor, I learned to create from another's suffering my own usefulness. And once you know how to do this, you can never refuse. And I think for me, that sums up her use as a scholar and the point and purpose of this book and actually of a number of her books. I see her posit her own usefulness. What is her purpose? What is her function? What can we find of use? Um, and I think it's that, it's what I've just said. She right. creates from other suffering her own usefulness and not in a parasitic way, mm -hmm. in a way that utterly is about naming experiences. I mean, she used a phrase yesterday, which actually chimes with what came up earlier. She talked about um, her complaint and the positionality of people who are institutionally precarious. Yes. Now that's, fa that's just a wonderful just distillation if we think for a moment back to your first questions about those who are made by the academy institutionally precarious. Yes. It's, a, 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 it's an institutional precariat. Absolutely. Who are they? Which is, yeah. which is of course just about everybody on this call as well, Romy. This, and you know, Guy Standing's work on the precariousness is, is profound. So I, I agree with you. I'm gonna ask you one crucial question though, Romy, because this is about yeah. the nature of academic life and I suppose the, the use, not so much of Sarah Ahmed, but the use of books. So that's, that's where, I was, where I was hoping we might go in this final gig today. So this series has been focused on the books. So what is the, the value for you of the scholarly monograph of a wonderful, brilliant group of people reading books and probing and exploring the books? Does that still have value for you, Romy? Of course it does, 150%, um, whether that is inside or outside the academy. And again, I know some people like to see the demarcation as, as the, well, there, there isn't one, but there is in all sorts of ways. And I think, you know, what, yes, you know, the fact that she's doing these series of presentations via universities, but anybody can access them is also really an important positionality where she's placing herself. It's I'm inside and I'm outside. She didn't deny that she was inside the academy yesterday but she also acknowledged her outsider status and that she provides provocation so back to your point which is about books and the use of books well 
they are portals, aren't they? They're disseminators of information. And I happen to say, and I want to flag this up, that one of the things that I find compelling about this book, but I also find compelling about living a feminist life and queer phenomenology, is that this is a, a scholar who is a storyteller. She approaches scholarship like storytelling. She re uses repetition and refrain like a poet. Those extended sentences with semicolons are there for a purpose. They're incantatory. They're spellbinding. And um, it, she's deeply accessible and deeply erudite. She is a mixture of many, many things, but she is using storytelling principles in order to engage us. And yesterday she was doing things. She was using sound that she was wrapping on the table she was looking at us direct into the camera she was using all sorts of performative storytelling functions oh beautifully said what a, what an evocative and powerful way to lead to the second half of our final seminar you're amazing Romy we, we all just want to be you and you should be running the world but you know it to be true but I, I wonder if I can just Leanne just hook in you for one moment and talk about your fabulousness and just get your point on the book as well because You've written your remarkable books uh, very much in the Precariat Academy, in contract work, all sorts of complicated situations. And of course, as I might be about to announce and maybe destroy your life, but I, I believe you're about to go to a rather fantastic job. But in many ways, it's still working in a university, but not as an academic job, but as a sort of almost cognate in between administrator and academic role so for you and your journey since your PhD which is now pretty well 20 years books for you darling and 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 the, the functionality as Romy said about the book for people all through their career including the people who have never had a chance to have a, a proper stable job in a university ever yeah uh, 20 years in I've got my first proper job Tara <laughs> And I don't know how I feel about it. It's it's a really interesting opportunity. I was I mean basically I'm in a place where I I I can't I don't think I can teach anymore, which I actually feel quite. Well, when I realise I actually feel quite emotional about that because I actually when I say I can't teach I actually mean that. It's not that I don't want to teach. I don't think I can anymore. It's me so upset. <laughs> one of the best you're one of the best teachers i've ever seen in the world actually well yeah well you know i don't know about that but um so when this this is a job that is in the university but it's not a teaching and it's not an academic job and this kind of surprised me that that's where i am it's 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 interesting it's going to be an adjustment but in terms of books and writing because I felt the corrosion of higher education particularly in this country the books have been the place where I have done the difficult work yeah. and when I started back when I was a baby academic the, the reason why I'm here today is because the hard work was in the seminars that we did back at Murdoch University yeah. when I was a baby. <laughs> and that was, you know, th there's these, world, uh, these worlds that opened up and in those seminars. And that's why I've, I've made the time to be up, for me, ridiculously early <laughs> to, to be here. <laughs> And, you know, um, so my books for me are fraught because they require me to, uh, and the last book was so interesting and maybe one day we'll discuss it, Tara, because I thought it, uh, I was full of hubris, full of hubris. I was like, oh, I'm just going to knock this, this book, I'm just going to knock this book out. And it, it didn't turn out that way. It became a very difficult for book because it's where I do the hard thinking and it's a real tragedy for me that that hard thinking has to happen actually outside of the university well said well said and Leander I'm so much to say about that that book I intend to run actually a seminar on on your second book by the way but it was the only only piece of of 
it's the only book I've ever read. And of course, probably that's because I love you. Like, you know, I kind of, it's not even like a, a sisterly thing. The complexity of our relationship over 20, however many years, I can't even put into words. But I was so upset by reading it that you could see the blood on the page, right? And I actually had to have a pause, have a cry, come back and go again. And and I've, I've never had to do that with a book. So it, you could see the 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 life that had been lived to go into that book extraordinary so the books do matter yeah i think the books do matter and they matter even more today as they are increasingly uh deprioritized in many ways but they matter because they allow space for the difficult work to do and part of my trajectory with the second book is there was a moment i had to stop. There was a moment I had to let it go and realize that it was actually up to my audience or whoever was going to read it to make of it what they were going to make of it. I couldn't do any more on the page yeah. to, you know, shove it into or mold it into the idea that I wanted it to be. Or and you know, and that's the, the trajectory of any writer, any author is that moment of release of letting it go of saying I have put all the words together as best as I know how right now and maybe in five years I would have done it better <laughs> but right now this is this is my space and where the complexity is coming out and so for me I've always protected that space very much so and that's why I'm of course I'm quite anxious about this new position because it's encroaching into that space so I'm going to have to develop new strategies of of how I keep protecting that space because I'm writing the third book now, Tara. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I've, I, it's it's a it's a it's a space for me where it is not only the manifestation of the own my own complexity and my own ways of thinking, but how that complexity interfaces with other people's anger, joy, uh, a, um, you know, frustration, disappointments. And I think that is the incredible value because books allow time. Yeah. They allow time, time for the writer and time for the reader. Really well said. I mean, I've always described a scholarly monograph as a photograph. And when we engage with it, we must always remember it's of a point in time and that person has aged and changed and transformed. But Thomas, hasn't Leanne just captured your argument about what is the university for? I mean, none of that research was done in a building funded uh, there was no grants there. It, you know, it, it was a person with a computer in a room, you know? It's, al it's almost as if the university is a shopping mall for diplomas. You are absolutely brilliant. Can I uh, come straight back to you in a second, Thomas? Can I go to wonderful Melanie? Now, Melanie, you're in one of these odd, complicated jobs as well. A, a great scholar, great human being, and yet... To, to get some coin uh, to, to, to make a living, you're, you're doing other things now. Mel, do you want to talk about that in terms of and how you engage with, with research such as this? Now, what is the use of research and the use of books for you in this type of environment now? Mm. Well, so it's kind of interesting because I was in the university administration job before I did my PhD. Mm. And I initially hit this point where in order to continue to advance in my career, they want people to have PhDs um, because in the past they would have been filled by academics, but now there's no academics because <laughs> there's no, <laughs> there's no pipeline. It's all casualized. So they want you to have a PhD and I wanted to do the PhD anyway. So I did it also because I knew that I needed it to advance in this other side of the career. So uh, my intention was never to be a full-time academic because I knew that wasn't a possibility, but to come back into my other career path that I was on before I did the PhD. Um, but I find myself still wanting to engage in that research and, and that life of the mind. Um, and so while I've been working, like I just turned in my, my book manuscript but I don't, you know, while I'm working full time, but I don't know how long I can juggle it. You know, I have friends, I'm American, so all of my friends have side hustles because um, we're 
capitalists and you know, we can't have hobbies, we have to have side hustles. And, you know, I just talk about, well, my side hustle doesn't bring in any money. Um, you know, it's just what I well, do. It's just about citizenship. <laughs> that's all. It's just about in, improving humanity and the mind. Yeah, that's my side hustle. Yeah, sorry about that. But how, how do you feel trying to do that, that juggling? How are, you, how are you feeling about that use of you? I... Yeah, I, I, the parts of the, the book where she's talking about people becoming used up um, really resonated because, yeah, the one of the reasons, so I did my PhD in Australia and I needed to get out of the United States because our work culture in the United States does just use people up, like that image of the toothpaste roll that she has in, in, in chapter two, like that is, mm -hmm. that is what we do. Um, and... Uh, I had this beautiful experience as a PhD where I'm just living the life of the mind and, and I was out of that. And now, you know, I've come back and I'm getting back into administration and I'm definitely feeling that the work, the American work culture and the feeling of getting used up at work. So it's like, how much energy can I have to do the, the books and the thinking outside of work? Um, you know, just because that's what I want to do and that's what brings me happiness to go back to their last book. But I've, I don't know how much energy I can reserve for life outside of work because work demands that, um, that I put all of myself into work. Um, and so then you don't have anything left for afterwards. So I don't know how long I'm going to be able to continue to do my own research and I'm looking at everybody's face. I don't know if you're seeing everybody's face on this call. I think you've captured uh, exactly what's going on on the planet at the moment. Are you all right, sweetie? You all right? Um, you are a very powerful, astonishingly important human, okay? And and you are loved and you are cared for. And the hard yakka that you're doing makes a difference, okay? And, and you've got all of us now, so I'll be reading and refereeing and doing your books and helping you with your books for the rest of your life, as long as I can stay upright, all right? All right. Well, I just want to say to Leanne, God, yeah, I, I wish you the best of <laughs> the best. Um, yeah, it will be tough, but yeah. But it will be I also to... like having, um, the, getting the paycheck every two weeks is amazing i have to say and um, i'm american and i have health insurance now which i haven't for the last year so that's amazing too so like it's trade-offs and, and, and thomas has expressed a level of excitement about health insurance that i've only <laughs> ever seen with certain animals in response to a hamburger thomas so that's absolutely <laughs> fantastic oh mel darling you're very precious i'll give you just a minute to i'll come back to you in a sec but let's all just because i'm quite i'm quite emotional that is that is exactly what is going on with the planet. And Karima is just grabbing a child and moving forward. We'll return to Karima in a second. But Thomas, mm -hmm. let's you and I have a conversation about Donald Trump, shall we? You ready? Oh, lovely. Let's do this. So remember him? Remember him? Uh, yeah, yep, yeah, nope. He's still burned into my consciousness until the day I die. Satan, Satan, Satan. Okay, so <laughs> use and uselessness. Now, there was this great phrase that actually I've, I've got on my office wall at home at the moment on page 131 what is most useful is what is useful to the most end of quote and I'm probably going to do a terrible thing and Romy can 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 go for me on this because I'm interested in that but I wonder if so what is useful is what is useful to the most I wonder if there's a confusion there between populism and popular culture so in other words something you know, Donald Trump was not useful to the most. And that's because he was populist, not part of popular culture. So is usefulness democratic? Is usefulness about the majority or is actually now post-Trump usefulness a populist trope? I would push back against what is useful is useful to the most mm -hmm. i think what is useful is most useful to the powerful mm -hmm. because we don't quite get so like if you think about the donald trump 
and you think of him as the trope, a lot of the sentiment around him was kind of this paradox of the population that voted for him and supported him thought that they were essentially throwing a bomb into the White House. Yeah. And so, but he embodied that, but he as the individual was supportive of the most powerful. Yeah. And so not even the people that voted for him got to get use of him, except for perhaps like their own self-esteem and self-identification and, you know, see themselves reflected in their values. But when it came down to it, it wasn't actually the bomb that they thought that they had planted. And so <clears throat> I don't think that um, usefulness is necessarily populist. I think it could be, you know, if we go into like the conversation about queering usefulness, I think it can be utilized for that. But as it stands right now, and particularly with what we just talked about with the university, usefulness is not good for most people within the university. And so there is the assumption, because the nature of populism is different from popular culture, is populism is the assumption of democracy. So they skip a level. So Trump says, you know, most people say, um, everybody agrees with me. Anyone that uses those sort of phrases, Robbie, we get it a lot with our Boris. Um, you know, <laughs> most people will go out, we'll, we'll clap the NHS, won't we all, right? So it's the mobilization of a majority that doesn't exist. So that's the, mm -hmm. the skipper representational level. The representative democratic level so the use variable can be useful for that project i think as trump showed mm -hmm. yeah no i think it can be um but honestly i think it was just in line with how we use use anyway i think it was just dressed up differently um because we really didn't see a change in trajectory with donald trump like he was like the logical conclusion of reaganism here so it was kind of like, you think you're being revolutionary, you think you're seizing the utility of state, but really you're just swimming in your own neoliberal identity. Perfectly said, perfectly said. You're an absolute legend. Can I go to Alyssa now? Alyssa, we'll see how we go. Wonderful, Alyssa. Say hi, darling. Hi. How are you? Good. So I think, so I think I'm going to try and ask a question. You may have to turn your glamorousness off, Alyssa. And again, the yellow was such a good choice today. So I apologize for that. But let's, let's talk about, oh, there she is. So everyone has a good look at the yellow. That was great, great haircut, great new bookcase. It's all happening, Alyssa. The use and the uses of the university. So let's bring Thomas's point home here. Now, you're in a university, you've been part of a university, it's part of your secondary socialization, you are a young, fabulous human. So is the use of a university diversity? Is it accessibility? And I'll use that great line, one, page 190, a history of a university is a history of what and who has been selected, as well as what and who has not been. So can we talk a little bit about the positioning of particular types of research and particular types of people in the project of what a university is. Put another way, Alyssa, with your fabulous face like that, um, how, how is belonging created? How does someone belong into this system, particularly a doctoral program? Okay, so I've never felt particularly like I belong at uni. Um, yeah, it's always been a bit weird like it didn't quite fit um i think a lot of it's to do with imposter syndrome uh, possibly i might not have imposter syndrome i might actually be crap who knows that's the problem but um especially starting phd i felt like i didn't fit what a phd student is but i also can't articulate what a phd student is so it's kind of i, I don't really know um one of the things I have faced a bit is people asking me why I chose to do what I'm studying and why I didn't choose something more useful. Um, and that was something that kind of came up for me when I was reading the book, is the idea of useful information. And so I did a, a business degree and that was okay because business is useful. Uh, and my behavioral science degree, useful, um, until you get a job with either of them. And I did a master of arts and everyone was like, that's useless. Um, I think there's a perception almost 
that universities, I, I feel they're pushing a vocational angle with a lot of the courses. There's a lot of employment outcome talk. I, I do think it's important to be able to get a job. Um, but I think there's an idea that certain ways of looking at things are more useful than others because you can use them for economic benefit. Like if it helps you survive in a workplace and make money, then it is more useful than things that help you think about things. Yeah, so you're a young you're a young woman in a humanities PhD working in popular culture, nay, gaming cultures, right? So everything's going wrong. So at the very era that uh, I'm getting a question all the time, in fact, I've been asked to do a vlog on one, like, what's the use of a PhD now? How, how would you answer that question, Alyssa? What's the use of doing a PhD? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think what I've learned, because I, I originally came into it, and I thought it was to produce this document, and then you become a doctor, right? But um, I think it's more about the skills that you learn. So I think that the PhD process, hopefully, teaches you a kind of way of interacting with information, an approach to kind of intellectual curiosity, and all that shit, really. It's about leveling up your thinking game. And, and, and there it would be. We're back to Melanie's magnificent point. Um, beautifully said, Alyssa, you are an absolute rock star. Can I go to beautiful Amira? Hello, Amira. Hello. How are you, my queen? Oh, I am well, thank you very much. Now, I saved a special moment of this gig nearing the end for you and I, because I, again, I can't imagine or remember my life without you. You've changed my life on more occasions than I can talk about, right? So when we're talking about life, should you and I, as we're reaching the end of this party, talk about death? Yes. <laughs> Why not? Why not? So again, in this book, because I, you know, the old goth that I am, and I'll do this again. I know this is Tom's favourite bit of every week that I do. So obviously I have not only one skull, I have I have two skulls in my office. Like I go hard, right? I go hard. Right. So the use of death, right? What I do, Thomas, by the way, is when students are going, life's a bit difficult. And I go, really? Is it? Really? Really? It's not going well. Good. Okay living the dream so in this book there is the discussion about the use of death amira and your know, death can be used as a warning so life is useful and death is not now thinking about everything particularly in the united kingdom that's happened with with covid and the management of death and the neglect of public health what do you see as the use of death now in a post-COVID environment? Wow. Um, the use of death in a post-COVID environment. Or Amira, the other um, one, how is what does life mean now? Has, has life been cheapened? Has life, has life been sucked of meaning, as Melanie talked about so beautifully? You know, has that, what's happened to life and death through all of this and its use? Um, and it's, I, I think it's use in this is the way that we'll talk about the UK, the way that the UK society is set up has maybe an unmasking of its real use, um, the real use of life and death. Um, and I think more than anything, that's what COVID has highlighted to a lot of people that they are just an employee number, a statistic, a job role, um, and even a lot of the use of life and death, even within people's relationships intimate relationships also within their family dynamics I think lots of things have also been revealed I um, mean that sense so I think it's an unmasking more than um a realigning if that makes sense look it look it does and Aidan I'll go quickly to you because I am interested in that unmasking uh in terms of in Australia we've been incredibly lucky as wonderful Amira said um with our with our COVID matter and not many people have died but I wonder how life and death and how it's managed through consumerism has transformed for you through this process? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting watching the 
rest of the world change i think i think the thing the thing for me has been watching um the world talk about work and um how that's kind of shifted and i like i listen to some really weird productivity podcasts like they're not they're not about they're not anyway look i won't go into it no but just they, they've <laughs> they've started talking about how you know like working from home and the changing conditions of work and like all of that stuff has been really interesting to listen to because it's like in australia we're still just like going into the office it's still like i mean like you know melbourne might be the exception but for most of us yeah we still just like rock up at i don't know nine ish finish at five ish and back home we go but we're talking like in the states particularly in the uk in canada you know in all these places where there's big sort of outbreaks work has changed dramatically and and what's expected of what you know like there are huge expectations on people now to work late into the nights and like it's sort of absorbed all of that leisure you know those leisure spaces have been absorbed and i think that's like honestly that's almost a death of culture in a way so if you want to come back to death you know it's like you're losing anything but your work identity you're only you're only valued for your use value in a you know office or whatever and then you will be discarded i've had a great sense of you know that 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 life has bled into death that, that it's no longer a functional binary opposition that this thing is now very messed up and once our use value as workers has gone um if, if we can't shop and we can't work then then it has become quite uh um orwellian and i'm using orwellian intentionally there it has become the this is the end game this is the end game final comment from beautiful karima darling are you okay everything everything cool at home and it was all happening there karima darling have you got it was just bedtime so go to bed right I, I I love that. I'm I'm going to be using that with students too much of the day. It's over. Just sort yourself out. Sort yeah, yourself. it's over. The day is done. That's what I say. The day the day is done. It's over. Look, Damn, want... Not for me. The day's just getting started now. Well, let's you and I get the party started, shall we? Or indeed, do our what I hope is a moving ending. I did write this one for you, hoping you'd be with us today. The use and the used, and the way in which touch operates with things. So the question I had for you is, is how how touching an object changes it, darling. So I was thinking, you know, people live in used houses. Most of us have never lived in a new house. I've never lived in a new house, never will. So we're quite cool living in like, oh, that's a secondhand house. And I'll, I'll buy that. That's fine. That's normal. But the idea of eating sort of secondhand food out of a bin is something that's supposedly a bit of a problem, right? So how do we naturalize those hierarchies of use through through touch? How does touch change how you, you value something my queen well i i'm just what's coming to mind is what ahmed talked about you know sometimes it devalues and then other times it adds value you know she talks about used books a lot and then the used book uh that has an inscription you know from the author you know so oh i don't know touch touching things well i'm definitely Part of that camp where if I really like something I don't touch it and I don't use it and I save it for special occasions you know I really could relate when she talked about that little bit about use it's like yeah you know this is so so good not useful but this item or this object is so important to me that I'm not going to use it right or I'm only going to use it are you one of those people that has flatware like you know your flatware and you have your no, best no, no. you have your, no, no. your best cutlery no, no. I mean, like, I'm obsessed I mean, by those people. So much, I have a lot of nice clothes downstairs in my closet, but today's the first seminar only because my mom gave me a sweater where I didn't just wear a sweatshirt that I was wearing all day. You know, like, here I am making my internet debut on YouTube. Why didn't I wear one of my nice blouses? Or, you know, but it was just, I don't know where I'm going with this, but just. I don't know, touching, uh, I'm sorry, you want to have a big ending here, but... No, no, it's a great ending. It's a great ending because it's about the investment, the self-investment in and through objects, and that that's often an arbitrary investment. Yes, definitely. So, I, I totally agree so with that. If, if I can crunch this home, summoning the legendary Thomas. So the powerful configure and coordinate use and they invest their power in particular manifestations of use, while the rest of us are buying weird stuff, 
touching it oddly, deciding not to touch it. Oh, no, that's best. No, I'm going to save that jacket, save that jacket. Um, my, my wonderful mother, who's 90, I bought her lots of posh underwear uh, in about 1987. And she said, oh, no, I'll, I'll save it for when I go into hospital. Save it for when I, And, of course, she's never gone into hospital. So she's never worn the underwear. She saved it for best. So, but that's about the nature of touch, isn't it? So you don't, you don't touch because when you need it, like when you're in hospital, you want to look, you want to look nice. Whereas maybe where this seminar has taken us all, uh, dear comrades, is that what we've learned, I think, is that community matters. Community in dark times matters. Difficult communication really matters. And this complicated, diverse, wonderful international group of people got together based in a university called Flinders. Most of you probably never heard of this institution. Most of you probably never even heard of Adelaide. Some of you have gone Australia, oh, that was sort of like a knockoff England that was colonised and sort of buggered up colonisation pretty badly. I mean, that's basically it. So this seminar has come from a pimple on the arse of the world, right? And yet from this location, these profoundly stunning scholars that I've had a pleasure to meet in the last eight or nine weeks, have engaged with some truths that will help me finish 2021. So I wanna thank you for your reading. I wanna thank you for your thinking. I wanna thank you for your talking. And you know, we've got friends for life that we've created here and my life has been improved by meeting you. So thank you for everything you've done. And I wish you love and happiness and brilliance and joy. And I'll see you soon next time somewhere on this planet. Love yous all. We're out. Do you have another series plan, Tara? We, we, yes, we will try and run. We will try and run different reading gigs. We try to. And obviously how we'll do it, Romy Darlin, is that when I run it for my Flinders crew, I'll always make it for everybody and free. So if we're running it, then, you know, if Aidan and I can stare at each other for an hour and we can do that and we have done that and that's that's interesting television. But <laughs> it's it's actually very interesting if we can get the, the community together. And can I say the Flinders University community has been enhanced by all of you. So, so we thank you. This is proper internationalization uh, without capitalism. And I thank you all for sharing the time with us. Have, have a great day, Leanne, and good evening to our wonderful colleagues that have joined us so late. Bye everyone. Love ya. Yeah.